This is Chris McGrory with another episode of The Range Project. I'm currently a senior on the baseball team at Harvard, and in these conversations, I try to learn from those around me. My goal is to uncover what my amazing guests do and how they do it. That means getting the tools, tactics, and routines they use, plus the mental frameworks they have so you and I can apply them in our own lives. On the podcast today, we have a friend of mine who I'm lucky to say I met on one of the first days of college, Caroline Noble. Our conversations always get pretty deep, reflecting on our own experiences, latest perspectives, and newfound understandings, and this conversation is no exception. So who is Caroline Noble? From San Anselmo in the San Francisco Bay Area, Caroline is the captain of the Harvard Radcliffe heavyweight crew team, studies human developmental and regenerative biology on the pre-med track, and has used that academic interest in her volunteering in the McKinley lab studying how tissues in the endometrium regenerate and her biotech consulting role last summer. More interesting than what she does, though, in my opinion, is how she thinks about what she's doing. In an environment that puts pressure on doing what gets extrinsically rewarded, Caroline has recently come to not only listen to, but also follow her intuition in a direction that is more intrinsically rewarding. For her semester off due to the COVID pandemic this fall, She followed the little voice in her head and feeling in her chest that told her working on a farm to learn regenerative agriculture might be exactly what she needed. And as you can probably guess, we dig into how she made that against the green decision and how that has largely shifted her perspective on feeling content. And on top of that, in this conversation, we talk about the role food and other daily practices played in overcoming her health setbacks, what she learned living by herself in a cabin for the entire fall, what exactly regenerative agriculture and ranching is, and so much more. But the thread through it all is following intuition, an intangible concept that we all possess and one Caroline has made me deeply reconsider and begin to listen to. So, without further ado, here's my conversation with Caroline Noble. One, two, three, do it! Caroline, how are you doing? I'm very well. How are you, Chris? I'm good. I'm good. And remind me if I'm wrong, you were calling from San Francisco. You're calling from home? I'm calling from San Anselmo, which is about 45 minutes north of San Francisco. Gotcha. Okay. Well, thank you so very much for hopping on a call. Last minute, we connected yesterday and threw out the idea of the podcast. And 24 hours later, we're making it happen. So thank you. Around. It is my pleasure. I'm happy to get to talk to you. Awesome. So I'm thinking when I was prepping for this conversation we've we've known each other since like the first week of freshman year literally like day one yeah right so it's kind of fun being able to to see you change over four years which we'll get into if that's cool but um yeah i I'd, I'd like to start before i knew you and better understand your life before harvard so You're from San Francisco, San Anselmo. Mm -hmm. And like I said, in reflecting for this conversation, I can see like both identities of the San Francisco Bay Area in you. Do you (laughs) see that? Yes. Okay. So I'm thinking like the Silicon Valley work ethic in your school, in your crew. Oh. And like you're kind of like Whole Foods hippie 
vibe. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I'm thinking, or I'm wondering, which would you say was more a part of your environment growing up? Because I've seen both sides. That is really funny that you start with that because those two conflicting parts have been, I would say, the defining thing about college so far, and especially about recently, um, kind of like they feel mutually exclusive, but I've recently learned that they do not have to be. So in high school, it was pretty much entirely the former. I was, I would say, pretty type A. Um, I was a rower in high school. Um, I did, I don't know, like all the nerdy classes. I was just really into like, just, I don't know, I was a stress case, I guess, but I was happy <laughs> and um, all that was going well. I um, I was doing everything. And then junior year of high school, no, sophomore year of high school, I got hit with a Lyme disease diagnosis that kind of stopped me in my tracks and um, forced me to be like, whoa, you know, maybe being busy all the time won't be an option anymore when I'm chronically in bed and I'm tired and sick, whatever. So uh, I kind of fought that. I didn't listen to my body and pushed through that junior year, senior year of high school, got recruited um, for college rowing. Everything was good. And then it wasn't until I had my major health meltdown freshman year of college, which you were there for freshman. I can't remember what class do we have together. Oh, econ. Right. I missed five weeks of freshman year because I just couldn't do it anymore. So after that, I would say the hippie side has ruled my life. Um, And so there's still both aspects, but Um, yeah, it is funny coming home to my childhood room and everything. And I just feel like things have come a long way. So no doubt. And you mentioned rowing and I mean, coming in both of us as recruited athletes, that's a lot of our identities. If not, I'll speak for myself. It was my entire identity. (laughs) So what growing up, was it super intense or was it super fun or somewhere in between? Well, rowing is unique because you don't start till later. So I didn't start until my freshman year of high school. So unlike you, right. who sure, like got a baseball for their second birthday or something like that. Not wrong. Yes. <laughs> um, it was kind of a later addition, um, but it was a huge part of my life, um, time wise and identity wise for sure. And coming to college, I thought that that's all that I would want to do. You know, I was first thinking about my sport and second thinking about what I was going to study, um, and that has definitely changed. I still love the sport, but. I think as you get older, you kind of realize what it is you like is not necessarily the physical aspect. And there are so many elements of athletics that um, are about teammates and values. Sure. And, so. and I mean, rowing especially is intense. Maybe remind me and paint me a picture of like what that schedule looked like. I mean, rowers in Kirkland House would be coming in to breakfast before I, I was strolling in and they had just, okay. they had just gotten off the water. That's, you're underselling. You guys work really hard as well. But yes, it was a big time commitment in college. I actually spent more time rowing in high school because there are no laws or rules. But in college, you max out at 20 hours a week. So sure. I'll speak just for college. But I think we had nine practices a week or 10. And it was double days every day except Wednesday and Friday. And um, I mean, wake ups were probably, I don't remember six o'clock and five forty five, depending. And then we would practice for two hours, two and a half hours. And every night we were eating dinner, eight thirty PM in Dunster. So it was a grind, but my team, I mean, you know, they're like your family. So it didn't feel like work. It was so, so fun. Exactly. That's the best part of sports are those, those people you wouldn't meet otherwise. I don't yeah. know for me, like people that might not have the same interest, but we're on the same baseball team. And then those are going to be dudes I'm friends with forever. Yes. Literally my team is my family, especially because my younger sister uh, is on the team with me. And so shout out Sally. Shout out Sally. That was a big part of high school and college for me um, was getting to share that with her. So jumping ahead to those, those setbacks, you had the Lyme disease, some nagging injuries, time away from the sport. Mm. How did that shift, if at all, your perspective on like the physical part of rowing and be, just being a student athlete more generally? Yeah. Well, I'd say there's two parts to that. The first is that it made me realize how much more there is 
that I love than just sports, right? There are other things that are important to me. But the second is just within health. Um, it really made me wake up to the fact that health is so much more than a diagnosis or a medicine or, you know, a cause and effect, simple answer. Uh, health is a really complicated equilibrium and we have much more control and power over our, our own health than uh, we're led to believe. So for instance, you know, when things kept happening to me and I was so pissed, and I was like, why can't the doctors figure this out? Uh, it's not that they couldn't figure it out. It's that there were things that I could have done, diet, exercise, emotional well-being, relationships that I needed to take into my own hands. And then, you know, once I felt like the power was back with me, the whole world opened up because it's just awesome. So I would say overall, the health challenges were a major uh, benefit to just my overall growth <laughs> yeah. or happiness. I don't know. Right. So, I mean, I had a back injury. I broke a uh, stress fracture my senior year of high school, played through it. I know you know this story, but time away from that game is what led me to reading, what led me to listening to podcasts. What I mean, I couldn't do anything. So I was like, well, I guess if I'm sitting, I guess I'll pick up a book. I've watched seven hours of YouTube, like uh -huh. may as well do something. But can you say more about your thoughts on like what was in your control when it came to your health and particularly what was most helpful for you getting from, I'll say quote unquote, unhealthy mm -hmm. to where you are today, overall more healthy. And I will say like, it is not, I don't want to act like I have all the answers because it's a constant learning experience. But for me, the biggest change was uh, food and I think a lot of times we're led to believe that food is just a collection of nutrients and you need to have this balanced diet and all athletes think about eating healthy, but it goes beyond that. Um, food can be medicine and it has been in many cultures. Uh, I think it's like 60% of the world uses herbal medicine instead of pharmaceuticals. And so, you know, plants are really powerful and this is where the hippie side comes out. But I mean, so I guess when I was like down in the bottom, I had to cut out all those things that everyone, you know, like gluten, dairy, sugar, whatever, cut that out for a while, started feeling better, started adding everything back to this day. Now I eat everything. Like I love food, but I just try to be cognizant of eating intuitively and listening to my body. And I mean, plants make up the majority of my diet, but that's not because I'm, you know, restricting in any way. It's just because they make me feel the best. And yeah. And so being kind of like the science fan that I am, I also love doing reading into, uh, why, you know, what, what plants are good for what, so what can help with your liver function or with your brain health or energy. And so all those things. Sure. And okay. I could go in a few directions here. We'll, we'll bookmark your sciencey side, oh, but okay. go back to go back to your diet and eating intuitively. Like that's mm -hmm. something that I've experimented with. And just this past semester, I've always been like oddly interested in like vegetarian and vegan diets mm -hmm. and the ethical part of it and the environmental aspect of it more specifically. And this semester, first time living on my own in an off-campus apartment so I had full oh, control. Did you do it? I, I did not go all in, but the I did. Vegan? No, no, I did breakfast and lunch. And then we would cook dinner together. So I wasn't going to convince my two roommates, Matt and Ian, like, hey guys, like I'm not eating like your chicken parm. Like, you kidding me? So, but that that's just what worked for me. And from my experience, what have you found has been what makes your body feel the best? That's really cool. Uh, first of all, I'm impressed that you did that because many people are interested, but few people actually like take the leap and actually try. Um, so that's really cool for me. Well, this, I guess is bringing in a different topic, but the time when food made me feel the absolute best was this fall when I was living and working on an organic farm and everything we ate came from the farm. And let me tell you, my cells were so happy. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> It was awesome. And, you know, we were having cheese and meat and veggies and things that in the past may have bothered me because for a while I was dairy free and certain meats would bother me, whatever, nothing. It was all like as it's meant to be. And I think so much of it has to do with, we don't know where our food comes from. And along the way, it probably has so much toxin exposure and things like that, that for people who are sensitive, who have an existing 
something, it can flare things up. So that sounds really high maintenance of me because obviously you can't grow all your own food, but I would just say the closer to the source, the better. That's an interesting perspective because what is popular today would be these like restrictive diets and yes. people like to put a label on it and like, oh no, I don't eat X, Y, Z. Yes. And you're talking more about where it's coming from. Quality. Exactly. So quality. Okay. So say more about that. What have you noticed was well, so, like a biggest change? So I'll just use an example of an apple, you know, the scientist would say that all apples are the same. They're made up of the same nutrients and the same, you know, whatever aspects. But if you actually sit with an apple, I'm not trying to trash talk HUDs, but let's talk about those apples that they have in all the D-Halls. Harvard University Dining Services. Hopefully they're not listening. Hopefully not. I love you HUDs if you are. You're trying your best. But anyways, think about an apple that you would find, you know, anywhere, just in an airport. Compare that to an apple that you pick right off of a tree. And anyone who has picked and eaten an apple off of a tree will tell you they are entirely different. And one is honestly still alive. And the hydration you get from that apple, the crunch, the taste, you know, it is all a different game. And so that is what I'll say about quality. But I just also wanted to say quickly about the intuitive eating side, because this is something that is ongoing, especially because when you're trying to listen to your body, a lot of times it's clouded by messages you're getting from, you know, what is labeled as healthy and not. And this isn't about avoiding quote unhealthy foods. It's about eating everything in moderation. And this woman named Clara Davis did a study in the 1920s, I believe, perhaps it was in the 1940s, but she convinced 20 unwed teen mothers to give her their babies for this study. And it was a four year long intuitive eating study where for every meal, she gave the babies an array of food and let them choose and then monitor what they ate. And at the end of the four years, she tested all their levels to see how healthy they were. And everyone was like, you know, these babies are going to be malnourished. They're just going to eat sugar. No, the babies monitored, they chose different foods. And some babies would, you know, eat one thing for every meal for two days in a row, just like choose one fruit and only eat that. And they must've needed something from that. And at the end of four years, they were healthier than the average baby. Like that speaks to how, you know, innate our wisdom is about food that we all discount so much with our fad diets and restriction. And as I said, I've had to restrict in the past for health reasons, but you know, now I'm just enjoying trying to get back to that baby inside, I guess. That's crazy because I've heard, I've listened to my fair share of hippies on podcasts who talk about food and diet and the like. And a lot of times they'll cite something like more the prehistoric human wouldn't they might eat say say they kill a cow and they feast and they eat red meat for two days and then they might not have it or like a week straight and then yeah. they might not have it for another six months yeah and then later that month they're only eating like the nuts and berries they can find in copious amounts you know totally but this is I like the science. Um, I'm biased towards the science that like, I've, I haven't heard that. That's cool. I know. I actually learned that in a uh, Harvard class last spring, uh, history of the human diet. So it was really, really interesting to me. And speaking to your thing about, you know, feasting on a cow for a month, like in another sense that it's really enjoyable to have food and to know you're only going to have it for a bit. Like, and that is why eating seasonally and knowing where your food comes from, like with grocery stores and all this, like we are so out of touch because Obviously, if you can have whatever you want at any moment, you're going to want unhealthy stuff. So in some ways, you do need to like be aware of access. So that's separate, but glad you found that interesting. No, yeah. I mean, these conversations are just excuses for me to ask questions that I'm curious about. So thank you. And I'm thinking we can talk about your pre-med track and that inclination of being sciencey and liking the data, what has your, let me ask a better question. Coming into Harvard, why did you want to go down the pre-med track? It seems like rowing plus pre-med is, uh, is an equation for a disaster. 
<laughs> less than you would think. No. Um, well, it was because of the health stuff. So I felt that through that experience, I'd learned a lot about lifestyle and I wanted to become a doctor so that I could help other people with chronic illness, essentially. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. So it was always two-sided because I never wanted to be just like a straight middle of the path doctor prescribing, but I wanted to have the ability to prescribe and in addition, involve the holistic medicine side. Was that your vision or was that informed by those around you? Was there pressure growing up? Like you will be either a doctor or a lawyer and that is it. (laughs) Or how is, how is that environment uh, fostering what you wanted to do? Yeah. Well, so uh, no, first of all, my parents would have been happy with whatever I wanted to do. They don't care, but it was very much externally motivated. So that has been something I've come to terms with lately is that in high school, early college, everything for me was about it's extrinsic motivation. And it was about, you know, um, how things appear to other people and coming off as, you know, impressive or successful. And I don't think I'm alone in that. I think a ton of people our age feel that way. So going down the pre-med track is really appealing because your whole life is laid out for you for the next 10 years. Like you just, you know, you take the right classes and you, then you apply and all these things. So it was about that for me and about the, um, I wouldn't say the status or anything like that, but more just like the certainty. Yes. Yeah. And because like I said, I've known you for four years, it was never ever in my consciousness that you were doing anything for, uh, because you, you wanted to have doctor in front of your name oh, for the rest of your life. But that, uh, what's the right word? That like tolerance for uncertainty. Yes. If it's pretty low, then the pre-med track is really appealing. And it's a great way to put that. For and that's me, how I was. For me in high school, I was like, all right, I'm going to take AP biology because I want to do pre-med because I won't have to make another decision for the rest of of my life, you know? Yeah. Um, and then a uh, two or three on an AP bio exam changed those plans. Oh, but no, 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 no. But you know, like there is, I've talked to Edwin about this. There's a lot of appeal in that certainty. But let's circle back to that extrinsic motivation. Like, what was it that made you feel the best about yourself? Ooh, that is a tough question. So this ties actually to the rowing stuff. Cause this is a conversation I've had a lot with my sister because both of us love the sport, but admit that we've struggled with self-care, I guess is the right way to say that because we were taught somehow that your value is in your ability to push yourself. And if you can push yourself to the absolute brink, that is the only time you deserve to feel satisfied when you cannot do any more. And and that's unhealthy for a lot of ways, reasons like, you know, living in moderation. It's not sustainable. That's for no, one. It's not sustainable. And it's just stupid. Sorry, but there's no reason. So for me, you know, I love biology. I don't know why I wasn't comfortable just saying I love learning about cells and tissues. Why, you know, why do I need to take it to that level of being like, I'm going to go as far as I can and study as much and as hard and all these things. So the extrinsic motivation was a means to push yourself to that limit, I guess. Whereas if you're intrinsically motivated and you're like, I'm just going to take what interests me. And that just happens to be biology. I would have ended up on the same path. I think, um, I study human developmental regenerative bio, which I love, you know, very few of those classes I had to take most of them. I would have wanted to take anyway. I find it fascinating, but I could have gotten here a much different way if it had been through internal motivation, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And what was, so it seems like for the listeners, there was some sort of shift. What was it for you? Was it, can you pinpoint a point in time? Was it a conversation you had with somebody or yourself or was it more like of a gradual shift in perspective? No, it was actually a pretty uh, distinct shift and it has happened since the pandemic. So pretty recent convertee over here, but I was super I don't know what the word is, happy. I'm not going to use the word satisfied because I wasn't entirely, but a year ago, taking all my classes, doing everything and things were going great, but something was always kind of missing in terms of contentedness and just feeling like I'd found my path. And for the listeners, that's a pre-med track 
a biotech consulting job. So yeah. like all of those things that are extrinsically valued, you're checking those boxes. No, well, okay. There are always more boxes to be checked, but sure. It was like, I think things were going well, I guess. And then, so the pandemic hit in March, kicked off campus, moved back home with my parents. Awesome. And then I heard this talk, this, uh, actually we were on a podcast about the topic of regenerative agriculture, which caught my attention because, you know, regenerative biology, regenerative agriculture, there's a similarity there, but also because when it was described, something about it just sat really well with me. And essentially it's farming and ranching in a way that's good for the soil, as opposed to maximizing output. And that leads to much higher nutrient density foods. So to make a long story short, ended up, you know, Googling and researching and finding a farm that I had never been to. And I reached out and asked if I could work for them. Bada bing, bada boom, drove eight hours, moved to the farm for four months. And I just got back. So the change to intrinsic motivation happened somewhere along that path. And I was not expecting it. And I didn't even know that it was a lack that I had, but that I would say has been the major shift. So you're like most of us at home during the pandemic on lockdown. And yeah. so you're just kind of noodling around the internet, finding what feels right. And then what was it that kind of, flip that switch for you like oh that just really resonated with you or do you just find yourself like kept digging and digging and just couldn't no, help yourself and I actually wasn't even wanting to take a gap semester it's not like I was looking for something to do um my mom just sent me this podcast by a man, man named Zach Bush and I listened to it and I've been into intuition uh since before college it has to do with the health stuff for me because intuition is kind of what got me through in a lot of ways. Um, and so I just had a feeling and I've learned to listen to that. And so that is how it did not come about in terms of looking for something to do it more. I feel like it found me almost. So you talk about that intuition, that listening to your yourself. What is that? Mm -hmm. What is that actually? <laughs> like, is, is it a, is it a feeling are you restless? You can't fall asleep. You just feel like you need to do this. Is it your journaling and mm. these thoughts pour on the page and it just feels right? What is that? No, it's actually like a physical sensation. Kind of funny. Um, Say more. Hippie side coming out. No, it's kind of um, like a blossoming feeling in my chest. That's like a, just like a pull, like a tug. And uh, that is something that has come about slowly. So I started reading books about the universe and manifestation and the law of attraction probably about four years ago. And I've just gone deeper and deeper into that, which has most recently come to fruition in daily practice. And with that, it's continuing to strengthen. So uh, yeah, I was laying on my deck, listening to a podcast, sunbathing. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, what's that? You know, I'm going to Google it. I'm going to keep looking. And it was scary. I did not, I, as I told you, as you probably know, I'm very much a planner type a, like knew what was coming. Uh, I thought, so this was a scary choice, but I am so grateful that I did it and that it came about. And I really, really feel like it was just more than I ever could have asked for. So, okay. So let's, let's talk more about, you said you mentioned a daily practice. Oh, yes. What is that look like? as specific as you would like to sh to share. Sure. Well, I mean, I'm clearly not embarrassed about it, even though it is probably a little embarrassing, but no, um, for me, it's actually taken form in this practice called Qigong, which is spelled with a Q um, before you. I don't know. Yeah, no, we will link it in the show notes, but that's kind of like the, the, like a physical practice, right? It is a physical practice. So don't think, don't think I don't know a little bit about this. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> Would. You would. Okay. Well, so I guess the root of it is listening to yourself and that can come through in so many different ways. For me, I am like an active, I don't do well just sitting. And so I've tried meditation and it wasn't, I mean, I would do it for 10 minutes a day. I did that for a couple of years, but I just didn't feel anything big. So Qigong is like, yeah, through your body, you connect with the energy around you, the energy within yourself and you can feel physical sensations. And that is not alone unique to me. Like most people feel that. Um, 
And so I wake up in the morning and do it for about 40 minutes. I was introduced to it by a friend named Cynthia Lee, who um, has a teacher and it's, they're all online. His name is Master Ming Tong. And um, you just watch the recording in the morning and it's made all the difference for me, honestly. And connecting to the health things, it helps me be more aware of symptoms and things coming on. And I've found it's actually improved my, whatever you want to call it, disorder, disorder or whatever. Like I feel great. I'm symptom free. And I credit that in large part. And when did that practice start for you? That was early pandemic. That was June. So these are all really recent changes to yeah. your routines. Yes. Very big changes because before that I was doing the meditation every day. Yeah. You were, you were on the Sam Harris wave. I was on that Sam Harris wave. I'm not off that, but yes, it's like, it's been a lot of long-term interests that kind of built to actual habit formation within the last six months, I would say. Gotcha. And what do you, what do you feel after a Qigong session? Is it like more of like a physical exercise? Like some people wake up and do 10 pushups in the morning, hundred pushups, you know, like, is it the physical aspect or is it more, is it something else? I feel probably, so no, it's not physically taxing, but you do move your body a lot. Oh, um, okay. Yes, is not equivalent to a push-up. I would never do those in the morning. <laughs> unlike some, <laughs> But anyway, no, I just feel really relaxed and happy um, and open. It's soft. It's very gentle, but it's nice. Very interesting because, yeah, I've, I've seen that tangentially in my studies of the hippie ways well, and yeah. the like, and yeah, no offense to using that word. We're using it very loosely, Fine. but that's interesting. And I think that just goes back to the better point, a uh, bigger point rather of you're experimenting on yourself. Yes. Is that something that's always been innate? Like you see something and you try it, or was that something like, were you searching for something else? What do you think it was? no. You and I are similar, I think, in that we both kind of experiment on ourselves. So yes. this is one of many things that I have just tried, but this one stuck. And I think that ties to intuition as well is because you can try 10 things and you have to actually be able to listen to yourself to know which one you want to pursue. Because you can't, I mean, life is short and you there's so many things people will tell you are good for you or even necessary to be healthy. And if you do all of them, you will have time for nothing else. So everyone's got to pick what to add to their routine, but yeah. I just tried it and really, really liked it. Love that. And so let's let's circle back to fall semester 2020. You weren't planning on going, taking a semester off, but you found uh, this farm online. So mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong. You cold emailed the <laughs> YouTube farmer, right? Yeah. On the nose, exactly introduced myself in the first sentence and then a couple sentences later asked if I could essentially move in with them. And you know what? I wasn't expecting much, but it worked out. It worked out. The universe takes care of you. I will tell you that much. But that idea of like the universe taking care of you very much contrasts the type A personality. Yes. So how do you, how do you square that? And so I guess in this is like most of my questions, very self-centered and just trying to help myself. So like, how do you balance that idea of action and things that you need to do, feel you need to do and trusting that, all right, there's a plan out there. There's, this is going to work out regardless you're going to learn from it. That's kind of my framework. I don't want to put words in your mouth. How yeah. do you think about those two ideas? It's a hard question, but I would probably say there's a fine line, right? Between belief in whatever you want to call it and feeling entitled to it because it is not at all that you deserve things or that things are just going to work out just because they will. I think a lot of it has to do with being grateful for what you have and working hard, not that sounds so preachy. And I didn't mean it like that, but I meant, you know, if I hadn't emailed them, it wouldn't have happened. It's not that I'm sitting here waiting for things to just appear in my life. It's more like I will put these small actions out there and have these larger intentions 
and trust that the point from A to Z is out of my control. And that one by one, little things, little things along the way will lead me where I'm trying to go. And beyond that, I have no idea. So I guess if that made any sense at all, that's how I square them. Was there any doubt or hesitancy in transitioning from that idea? I don't know. A lot of times I'll come up with a million reasons why not to do something. So how did you go from this idea like, You know, it would be cool if I was on a farm this fall. And then Mm -hmm. how did you take that idea? And for me, there's a many parallels, like it would be cool to do X, Y, Z, and then transition from that idea into action, sending an email and then going through with it. God. Yeah, it was scary. And especially because everything is so uncertain in the pandemic. I love your phrasing of how everyone has a different tolerance level for uncertainty because mine in the past has been very low. And this is the biggest risk I've probably taken ever. So, and it wasn't even that risky, which whatever. So I asked a lot of people's advice. I reached out to my academic advisors at school, two of them. I spoke to past teammates who are older, who work in consulting and asked them how they're liking it. And I spoke to friends and my parents and I just got a lot of input. And then I kind of just thought about it for a while. And I went on some hikes and I do write stuff down sometimes. In this case, that wasn't a big part of it, but I also visualized it working out, I guess. So I would like actively picture myself. This is so trite, but I'm a big fan of Taylor Swift and she dropped her the second to most recent album, Folklore. And I visualized myself (laughs) listening to it on the farm. I visualized myself driving my car with the windows down, playing those songs, looking out at this beautiful scenery and just like being there and being so happy. And I just like visualized it like with everything that I could. And then a couple months later, that is exactly what was happening. And so that is not the only time things like that have happened for me. And I find the like, imagery is the most powerful way to bring things into your life. So that doesn't have to do with the decision making as much. That was more making it happen, I guess. But yeah, no, they they go hand in hand because without that say that imagery and you see yourself like hey, this isn't so bad. I'm actually loving looking out at the valley and being able to like have sunshine coming down on me for 12 hours a day, you know, like what is what am I so afraid of? Yes. So you mentioned those other instances where you felt like things just kind of worked out for mm-hmm. unexplainable reasons. Can you share something else that is in that space? Yeah, I can tell you my number one <laughs> vision board experience. And this is the time because I mean, I probably sound like I feel so certain or sure of all of this. I do not like this is you know, this is what I believe, but no one can be sure of anything. So anyways, so last year I, with a couple friends, we decided to make some vision boards kind of as just a lighthearted thing. We were just hanging out, cutting pictures out of magazines, whatever. I printed out a photo of my favorite female entrepreneur. Her name is Carly Stein. She started a company called Beekeepers Naturals, which is a really cool company that makes medicinal products out of bee products. She was like Forbes 30 under 30. She's just super cool. I have heard about her on podcasts. I've read about her online. It was very much like a fan relationship that I had with her. Flash forward. So I put put a picture of her face on my vision, vision board just because I love her and I want to be like her. And then six months later, I'm walking back from the library in Cambridge with my roommate. It's a snowing outside. No one's really outside. We have our hoods up on our coats and we walk by this coffee shop and there's one table outside in the snowstorm. And there's a group of people sitting at the table drinking coffee. And I recognize a woman's voice and I'm like, oh my God, that's Carly Stein. And I completely, like, I started shaking. I got nervous. I like totally had stage fright. And my roommate's like, well, you got to go talk to her. And so I went over there and said, excuse me, are you Carly Stein? And she was surprised we recognized because she's not famous, but Yeah. And so then she invited me to her talk. I went to her talk. We ended up having a couple phone calls. We now have 
a relationship. She wanted to send products to our team to rep her company. And it has turned into like a actual tangible relationship with someone who I only knew. I mean, because I was obsessed with her and I'm not saying it's because I put her on my vision board. Like I understand it's, you know, chance and so much more, but that for me was the biz- biggest example of the law of attraction and manifesting things and having them come to fruition. That's so cool. I know. I'm so grateful that it happened. It was so awesome. It was so fun. That is so cool. So what did that vision board look like? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, let's dig into the vision board. I mean, we just printed out pictures on Google, cut them out and put them on like a nine by 11 piece of paper. And it was, as I said, it was very much done tongue in cheek. Like it was not something we were taking super seriously, but it was really fun. And I think it's really, and I mean, there are studies behind this done out of Harvard that people who write down their goals are more likely to achieve them. And I think this is similar where it's, if you think about things that you actually want to achieve or to do, they're more likely to happen because you will make them happen. Not because, you know, and that's this fine line that I have tried to emphasize is it's, it's not saying that everything's out of your control. I still very much think we are in the driver's seat, but that the universe wants to work with you, I guess. And that you put something out there and then an equal but opposite force like interacts with it. I don't even know how it works, but whatever. That's just what I think. Gotcha. So let's let's go back to life on the farm. You oh, yeah. you were living in a cabin by yourself. Am I right? You are absolutely right, which I didn't even think about before I went. The fact that I'd be living by myself <laughs> with no internet, <laughs> like in the middle, like I had never been there before. Um, but it was awesome. It was so fun. I was not fully alone because I was neighbors with the family I was working for, but it was solitude for sure. Can you run me through a typical day on the farm in the cabin? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So during the harvest, I got there in August. So it was their peak busy time. So we would, I'd wake up in the morning around six and then I would head over, I would drive like two doors down to their farm and we would go out and harvest. So, you know, they have every plant under the sun, um, but it was mostly like cucumbers, squash, uh, bell peppers, hot peppers, tomatoes, so many tomatoes, lettuce, all this stuff. We would just be harvesting all day. We'd stop for lunch and we'd have normally a big veggie scramble in their house. Myself, the, and then the husband and wife, Leah and Brian and delicious food with so much like just life in the food, the life, the food's vibrant. Um, so we would eat it for about an hour. And then the afternoon we would process everything that we had harvested. So that was, what does that mean? Yeah. That's like, packaging the cherry tomatoes into those little um, containers you see at the grocery store, or that's arranging all the um, cucumbers in a box. You know, you don't think about when food comes out of the ground, there's a step between. And my favorite thing to process actually turned out to be leeks, which I didn't really care about before the farm, but they're awesome. You pull them out of the ground. You got to stand over these things and like haul them out of the ground. They're covered in dirt. You spray them with a hose, trim the roots, trim the top, make it all look all like pretty um but it just you know the stewardship of land and of plants is is so fun and it's relaxing in a way that I never knew because most people who raise or who are raised in like an urban or suburban environment don't have gardening experience and so this was my first time with that and where did this food from the farm end up it, could I go to my grocery store down the street and pick this up or where did it end up? Yeah. So no, they sold it. They sell it locally. They sell it at farmer's markets and on this online food hub. Um, but that was a question I asked the woman, Leah, who is now, you know, my biggest mentor, but I said, you know, this food would sell for so much more in the Bay area. I was like, why don't you try to sell it there? Which now looking back is such a naive question because she looked at me and she was not saying in a rude way, but she said, yeah, but you know what? I'm just trying to feed my community. And in my mind, the goal of everything is expansion or in my mind, that's how it was, you know, obviously you want to get your farm as big as you can and, you know, be as profitable and touch as many people, but no, 
Leah is just trying to feed her community. She wants to feed her neighbors and she knows her food is the bomb and the best ever. And she's putting her whole life into growing it. And so she wants to give it to the people who matter most to her, not some yuppies in the Bay Area, which I just was like, wow. And it made me reconsider how I was thinking about things for sure. No, there's that's definitely a, a shift in perspectives. There's the idea of, okay, would you want to influence a million, but maybe not at the same level that you could the hundred biggest fans around you? And that ties directly back to the extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation because Leah is a badass. She has a master's degree. She's so smart and accomplished, but she's choosing to live in this rural community and homeschool her two daughters and run a family farm. And, you know, when you Google her name, do all these things come up with her impressive career and her accolades? No, but she is going so deep with the people who are lucky enough to know her. And I always thought that I wanted to do the former and, you know, go out there and, impact people or have a career. And now I'm seeing that I think true contentedness might come more when you have real relationships and you think less about your impact or, you know, external awards and things like that. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, for me, it's always come down to relationships and having deep relationships with those around me who matter most so it's weird to think that a goal of mine in a career or down the road like what you're shooting for would be something so far from that like oh I want to reach like I said a million people half a foot deep as opposed to like going a mile deep with with those that matter And it's funny you say that because I feel like in a social way, I was similar. I was never someone who had a ton of like semi-close friends. I've always been more fewer, but closer. Same here. But it's funny, you you make a great point to have that be in such conflict with how you're thinking about professional or even just like life goals, because they could be the same. And I had never interacted with people who were choosing a more private, but impactful life, I guess. I love that. Now let's go to the solitary lifestyle at the cabin. That is Mm. polar opposite of the go, go, go environment surrounded by thousands of other 20 year olds on a college campus. So I guess just more generally, like what was that like? And yeah, how did it change you? Well, I actually had been craving that for a while and I didn't really realize until I was looking at this fall in hindsight, because over the summer, I remember, well, I think everyone during the pandemic, moving back in with their families or whoever, you get kind of sick of being around people all the time. And so I did, there was this one weekend I went and drove up to a cabin and I was like, I'm going to do a weekend of silence. I'm not going to speak a word for 48 hours. And I did it. And it was really a funny experience, but now I can see that it was honestly kind of just the preface to what I ended up doing in the fall on a much less extreme, obviously level, but it was, uh, being alone, because I only worked three or four days a week. So I would at least be spending two days a week fully by myself. And I don't even know what to say. It was interesting. And I learned a ton. I got really comfortable being by myself and figuring out how to make a day interesting and plan a day around going on a hike and then cooking a delicious meal and then jumping in the creek and then reading. like, And that would be all for 12 hours or something. So doing less, but having those things be meaningful, I guess. And I learned I'm much more of an introvert than I thought. Because before I always wanted to be around people. And now when I'm around people, I like, I want to have some time by myself afterwards to kind of recover. Um, So overall, it was very positive, but different than I expected. Sure. And I mean, the introvert extrovert scale is all about like how you gather energy. So at least for me, being in a big crowd takes a lot of energy out of me. I'm lucky I, I've known that. And so what was it that you filled your days that you were most content with? Yeah, kind of what I mentioned. I love food. And so I would build my days around meals. So I'm a morning person, as I know you are too. So I tended to wake up and in the cabin, there were no shades, obviously. So I would wake up with sunrise, which when I got there was pretty dang early because it was summer. Um, 
So I'd wake up and I'm not a coffee drinker, but I love tea. And so I'd boil you two. Is that what you're going to say? I was going to say just this semester, I started drinking tea. So I'm going to ask you, what tea do you drink? Oh, many. I probably drink about six cups of tea a day. (laughs) Six cups? Caffeinated? No, no. Oh, no, no. Oh, when I say tea, I mean herbal tea. Oh, okay. So what are your favorites and what is like, what do you start your day with? Yes. Well, so the company that I get pretty much all tea from is called Traditional Medicinals. And I found it with all the health stuff because tea can be used. It's like, it's like an herb. So, um, I drink a lot of lemon balm tea, peppermint, uh, and rose hips all from traditional medicinals. And they can't say on there, you know, because of FDA things, they can't say the things the teas are used to treat, but Each tea has a specific, for instance, lemon balm is great for anxiety. And when you drink it, you feel super relaxed and sure how much of that is placebo. And you feel that way because you think you should, but in my mind, they're one, right? If it works, it works. So back to the routine, wake up, make some tea, eat breakfast. I love oatmeal. So I was making that every day in the cabin. And then I would go on a walk. I lived at the mouth of a Canyon. And so I would walk up the Canyon um, to the Creek and I'm not much of like a sitter. So sometimes I would try to make myself like sit by the creek and just think, but that didn't go super well. So typically I would walk then come back and read a little bit, make some lunch. Um, this is all my days off also when I'm going to be alone all day. Um, then go for a run in the afternoon. The Valley is really interesting because it's really high mountains on all sides and then super flat middle ground where you can just see across the entire Valley. So It's one of the most gorgeous places I've ever been. Um, So I would alternate between running up the canyon in the hills or out in the flats with the cows. Um, Come home, make dinner, make a fire, read. It was awesome. But I wouldn't want to do it every day forever because it does get lonely at times, for sure. So you talk a lot about planning your day around food. What were your favorite foods, any new foods that... You mentioned leeks. I've, I don't even know if I've ever had a leek. You definitely they, have. They're in stuff. It's like an onion. But um, new favorites, squash. I was never a squash fan growing up. I don't know. Are you? No. And I'm saying, yeah, I've never been a squash fan. Right. And so, but now I'm realizing, I think it was grocery store squash, which sounds so uppity. But when squash is fresh, like, so, so there's summer squash, winter squash. When I got I was lucky to be there through pretty much three seasons, summer, fall, winter. So I got to experience all the different seasons of food. And so the summer squash, when I got there, yellow summer squash, particularly that sauteed in a little olive oil with garlic. I mean, that could be a meal and it's by itself. It's so good and fulfilling. So I ate a ton of that. And then as it transitioned to winter, roasting up delicata squash, which I had never had. My mom actually has just started roasting delicata squash in I might be a convert, but keep going. Sorry. Oh, good. Delicata squash has actually been my go-to gift (laughs) lately. It's what I gave my parents. I'm about to give it to my roommate. I'm going to visit her. Like it's really pretty and it's delicious. Um, so those, I would say that was my favorite meal that I had never really been before. Other than that, I eat a lot of like grain bowls. So I love like starting with a bed of lettuce and then putting on like quinoa or rice or whatever, and then sauteed mushrooms or squash or veggies. I didn't really cook that much meat for myself just because the grocery store is like an hour and a half away. And so all my meat that I ate was with my host family. But that, when you were talking about the cow thing earlier, that reminded me because we slaughtered their goats, two goats while I was there. And right, goat meat sounds whack. No one would be like, oh, come have these goat meatballs. Yum, yum. Chris, it was the best meat I've ever had. Like it was so good. And I was there for the slaughtering and the processing of the meat. Like I saw it all. And then the next day when he grilled up a goat steak and we ate it caveman style with our fingers, I've never enjoyed meat more in my whole life ever. So. That's crazy because I've, I don't know if I mentioned, I haven't had red meat in months for like maybe, yeah, all, all of like 2020 pretty much. And that was more of like, I didn't think environmentally it is sustainable. Like I felt like I wasn't, I wasn't being a good citizen to the planet by like. I have so many thoughts. I have so many thoughts on this. Okay. Yes. And so what I'm, I guess I want to hear all of your thoughts, but maybe a question to guide it would be like, is that 
am I thinking about it in the wrong way? Should I be thinking about it more? I've never seen a cow slaughtered and then have it on my plate the next night. So what, I guess, let me hear your thoughts. The mic is all yours. Oh, thank you. The Zoom microphone. Um, well, first of all, good for you. That's really cool that you're doing that and that you're taking initiative to change your lifestyle based on what you've heard. The way cattle are raised in our country using traditional agriculture is horrendous. Excuse my strong language, but it's so bad for the cows. Their lives are awful. The environment is suffering because of, I mean, whatever, the methane and their piles of manure. Like it is just so not sustainable what we're doing. And the water. And and the water. And not to mention the smell for the people who have to live around those disgusting feedlots. Like, and I'm not saying this as some like vegan, right? Like I love red meat when it is quality, but that is what actually drew me to the farm. So regenerative agriculture is this different method of farming and ranching that instead of focusing on the crops, you focus on the soil health. And when that comes to grazers, so cows, you focus on the grassland and you let those, you've heard of grass fed cows, right? Yes. Yeah. So that's one, I guess it's one step beyond that where the cows are moved across pasture land in a very coordinated fashion to mimic the like old times with the plains and how bison were moved across by predators. And they've seen that the cows benefit obviously from walking and from eating many different types of grass, but the land benefits too. And the, the wa- the land will hold more water, the grass, when it's bitten on the top by the cow underground, the root will release carbon into the soil that then is sequestered. So through that, through this, uh, it's called, holistic planned grazing, it actually sequesters carbon and it fixes carbon out of the atmosphere and so potentially reverses climate change. And a new study actually just came out comparing a farm that's doing planned grazing with a traditional feedlot. And the planned grazing farm sequestered 66% more carbon than the traditional. So for you, avoiding red meat for environmental reasons and potentially for the animal ethics. And the health, just how I feel. Yes. So I would counter that with, there is another method of raising cattle that is better for the land, better for the cows and better for you. Last statistic I'll throw at you, sorry to have so many, is that this man named Gabe Brown, who is like the father of regenerative agriculture, really. uh, He lives in North Dakota and has this incredible ranch and they did studies on his beef, his meat and found it has the same omega six to three ratio nearly as wild caught salmon. So can I walk into Whole Foods and find a label that says pasture, give me the uh, name again? So it would be like regeneratively raised with cow. It would be, I guess, holistic land management. But no, the short answer, unfortunately, is no. They're working on it. They're actually working on like a certification for it because the food is entirely different. But on the note of this regenerative grazing in my layman's terms where i guess where are they selling it where can people find this do they need to like know a rancher yeah it's mostly sold near the source and so they don't need to know a rancher but these are the type of people you'll find at your farmer's market A lot of them are online. For instance, Gabe Brown sells all his meat through a website because it is so new to the scene. You know, Whole Foods, I bet you that they will carry it in, you know, two, five years. But just as of now, it's not yet infiltrated the mainstream. Even though these are practices, look at what we're doing. We're copying how things were thousands of years ago. Like, they're such old practices, but they're very new to the the language is new around them, I guess. And how did it, how did it, obviously you said it tasted amazing and it made you feel good. Yes. Made me feel awesome. And, and not in terms of, I ate it and was like, Oh, I feel so great, but it didn't make me feel bad at all. And, and I don't know if you agree, but processed food makes my stomach hurt. Like, but I still eat it, you know, I still go for whatever the Ben and Jerry's or whatever, like, but I just expect 
to not feel great afterwards, but I still do it most days, but just to be there for multiple months, pretty much just eating this food, I was struck by my body was just humming along. And for me coming from a time where I really did not feel that way, it was a striking difference. And this is again, another selfish question. You said you, your lunches and dinners were a lot of grain bowls, not a lot of meat. I mean, you're moving around all day on the farm. Those days you're not, you're going for a run. You're Mm -hmm. a division one athlete. A lot of people wonder like, where do you get your protein? So what do you say to that? And did you feel like run down? Oh, I can't, I can't go for my run. My muscles aren't recovered. How do you, how do you think about that? And then what did you do diet wise? Well, I actually had these exact same thoughts because my family eats meat pretty much every day. And so, and, and in college, there's always meat available. Um, so this was the least amount of meat I've ever eaten, I would say. And I was surprised by how satisfied I could feel. You eat a lot more, I guess, which is honestly for me, fun and good. Right. More volume, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. More volume. Um, and you can snack more and just, you don't feel like so super full where you just want to sit down. It's more like you just, I don't know, it, it, it fits the active move around a farm lifestyle better because you know you eat dinner and then after dinner sometimes they go out and milk the goats and all this is like part of the lifestyle um so it went well together i am curious actually this is a this is something i've been thinking about consciously is with the return to rowing training would i be able to keep a similarly vegetarian ish diet i don't think so just just because of being so hungry but maybe i'm not sure Sure. And you go back to like that energy piece. And that was the biggest thing for me in being like intuitive with my diet was I would have lunch. It would either be leftover dinner with that was mainly meat or a turkey deli sandwich or like a meat based meal. Mm -hmm. And I would just need to sit down and take a nap. I couldn't I I would have to, I felt like my body, it would take me two and a half hours just to digest and feel like, okay, I can do something active. And then now that I've kind of transitioned that, and that was literally the main reason changing my diet allowed me to work out in the afternoon when I wanted to. I used to have to run first thing in the morning because that's the only way that my stomach wouldn't hurt. But now it's like, yeah. And so the science side of that, right? Like carbohydrates don't require an additional organ to help digest them. They just go into your stomach and they get broken down, especially complex carbs. They'll stay in your stomach for a long time. Whereas anything with a fat in it, so a meat or a nut, all these things require your liver and all this other involvement. And I'm not saying you should only eat carbohydrates, but I think they get a bad rap and people always want to, you know, avoid bread and pasta and carbs. But I actually, this fall was thinking a lot about how, wow, eating primarily carbs in the form of vegetables and fruits and some grains, I feel like my body likes it. But I also think that everyone's body is different. And some people love meat and dairy and that is how they feel the best. So I don't know. And I've had friends who feel amazing on a ketogenic diet where they are eating cheese and butter and red meat. Mm -hmm. And that's just how that, what makes their body feel the best. Exactly. And it's unique for everyone and personalized nutrition. Like there's a reason that that term is starting to be more trendy because I think it's totally true. And I think our needs change, you know, with the winter, I found myself craving more heavy foods. Like, you know, I have been eating more red meat and I don't think, I think we should all work to avoid the rules and the labels that we've been taught about what food is quote good or quote bad because what all of a sudden 2020 butter is now good for you and people are putting it in everything in their coffee like everything in moderation I don't know I don't know no I love that and it just goes back to the idea of experimenting on yourself Mm -hmm. and figuring out what works best for you and yeah recently that means like backloading the heavy foods during dinner and a protein shake smoothie after dinner. Oh, got to get those gains. Well, yeah. I mean, for me, I feel like that's what my muscles want. Yeah. Okay. You work out 
and you might not have fueled them breakfast or uh, mainly lunch. So, okay. Yeah. Do it later in the day. Yeah. And I've learned I'm someone I love to have a big breakfast. Like my breakfast meal sometimes yep. is the biggest of my entire day. Same and, here. Yeah. And that's just, I don't know. And it's so fun to eat exactly what you're craving. Do you know that sensation where you're just like so satisfied and happy? And that's where I say food like brings me the most joy out of anything. That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> where can the people, more specifically me, learn oh, about okay. this stuff? Any resources that you would recommend or not recommend? Absolutely. I, who, okay. Well, so the Zach Bush, Bush podcast is big. He is a four, four, uh, he is a front runner in this movement. Um, quick asterisks there. He has some opinions about COVID that some people find pretty like dicey. And so that's just fair warning. One. Fair warning there. His stuff on regenerative agriculture is awesome. Um, other than that, the book Braiding Sweetgrass is written by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And it's about just returning to a more indigenous relationship to land and plants. And it's beautifully written. It's so enjoyable to read. For me, that just kind of helped me reframe all of it. Um, other books. Honestly, I don't have anything else to recommend because I'm still deep in the learning myself. I'm right now reading a book called Agriculture by Rudolf Steiner, who's like the forefounder of this movement. Um, and I'm trying to learn as much as I can, so I can keep you posted on it, but. Well, thank you. And that, I think, might transition nicely into my first and often favorite rapid fire question mm. of just trying to learn from others who, I mean, think about, you put out a book, this is years and years of research condensed into a few hours of digestible no pun intended material <laughs> so i'll ask you you said braiding for sweet sweetgrass braiding sweetgrass braiding sweetgrass which honestly i remember when some because oh leah my host mom is the one who recommended it to me and the title didn't grab me because it didn't sound like it was going to be a particularly like uplifting or interesting i don't know it I think might be my favorite book, at least my favorite book that I've read in the, it, during college. It's just been awesome. So it's nonfiction. It's a woman who is half uh, Native American. And so she talks about, and she's a scientist. So it talks about the conflicting belief patterns between nature as kin and nature as study object. And every chapter is just a little uh, vignette of a different experience. And it's, it's a beautiful book. My mom's reading it now because I won't stop talking about it. Uh, so that I would say is one of my favorite books. And then another is The Overstory, which I know I've recommended to you before, Chris. And I have read. <laughs> so that one, I mean, it's a pretty popular book, but it's awesome. And it's about the lives of many people intertwined through trees. And it's a beautiful book. Definitely the, um, the back of the cover and the hippie blurb definitely scared me. And it's a big <laughs> book. And it's fiction. So like all of these things were uh, together preventing me from picking it up and finally reading it, but got it on Kindle. So you can't like tell how big the book is in your hand, okay. which I've loved. And yeah, I, um, I don't think I understood it as well as you rave. It, oh. what, am I, what am I missing? Oh, interesting. What do you mean? Wait, elaborate. I guess I thought it was interesting, but I think I might have missed the take home message. And that might just have been like not me not being in the right frame of mind, new yeah. to reading fiction. Do you have any take home messages? Let me ask a better question. Why is the overstory particularly impactful for you? Uh, I'm interested to hear that feedback actually because it's not so much that it like changed the way I viewed things or anything like that. It was just to have a book where trees were such a focal point as opposed to a background 
was new to me and it's changed the way that when I'm walking around or looking out windows, I think about how trees are always there and we're never looking at them. Um, and then I also really liked how the writer incorporated a lot of science stuff in the way he just wrote about life. So there was no major take home message for me besides humans are not the center of the universe. And look at this, I study like a human bi biology and all these stem cell things. And I never once considered the fact that do plants have stem, stem cells? Like I had never even considered that we are just one small part of this whole dance in nature. So that book was the beginning of this new journey about all of that for me. So I think that is why it was impactful. So I don't know if that even answers your question, but. No, that definitely makes me feel better about being hazy on, oh, what it, I feel like my relationship with books is, oh, what did I learn? And maybe it doesn't have to be so tangible. Um, I can see why you like nonfiction then. That makes yes, sense. Definitely. My next question is centered around people. Mm. And I think I'd like to ask you maybe compare and contrast when you think of the word successful who is the first person that comes to mind now and then maybe who would have if you can go back who would the first person that come to mind have been you you pick the year interesting that's a good question now successful i would say leah larson my host mom founder of a nonprofit, you know co-owner of a farm mother all these things woman who agrees to take in a total stranger student who's just trying to like pitch whatever so that but a couple years ago i was really um i really admired a woman named cara mckinley who was actually supposed to be my thesis advisor until all of this went down um, and I'm no longer going to do a thesis, but she does research on the endometrium, which is the uterine lining in women. And it sloughs off and regenerates every month. And there is very uh, little understanding about that process. You know, what cells are responsible for that? Why is the rate of endometrial cancer so low? That clearly means that something there is going really well. Um, and she's awesome. She has a PhD. She's a Harvard professor. She's a feminists, like all these things. I look up to her so much and I still do. Absolutely. And I can find her incredibly successful, but that to me represents this shift where while one of these people is a Harvard professor and the other is a mom, I now hold them in the same regard. So it's not that either is more impressive than the other. So that would be my answer. No, that's awesome. It's you're allowing them to occupy the same space in like kind of two different lanes. And exactly. That's okay. exactly. I like that. And I don't know if you know, I, I like to have quotes, mantras and the like just on sticky notes or just kind of in the back of my mind and it can be new. It can be old, but do you find yourself repeating or thinking of a mantra or quote often or do you have one that kind of guides your life because it does seem like through it all and all these different stages you're very principled so I'm mm. wondering if there's something that is kind of like your anchor for that I like this question and I do love mantras and quotes um I want to hear some for you but uh Mine tend to change over time and it's kind of like I go through phases of them, but about a year ago, the one that I was relying on the most, I'd say, and it was my phone background. Like I was trying to live and breathe. It was by Paulo Coelho, who's the author of the alchemist. Um, and it was when you want something, all the universe conspires to help you achieve it. And so it ties to what we were talking about earlier, but just about how the energy of the universe is within everything. Um, and it's all connected. So that was one. And then after that, going into this fall, my big one was all I need is within me. And that's not a quote, but that's just a mantra where it was just like intrinsic, internal. You don't need anything else or anyone else's opinions. All it matters, all you need is within you. And right now I don't really have one. And I honestly think it's because I'm kind of coming to the end of this fall, which was just a humongous brain explosion learning experience. And I'm still processing and digesting all of that. Well, going back to your... First, that makes a lot of sense. But on 
face value, those two almost seem incompatible. Yeah. Right? One is like, let the universe take care of me. Yeah. And the other is I have a lot of agency over my life. Yeah. And I think it's the same question we were talking about earlier, which there's no great answer to, but it is these coexisting principles that I believe so strongly in both of them simultaneously. I guess I don't know how to answer that besides that both resonate as true to me. And I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. No. And that parallels a lot of the teachings of like Stoic philosophy, which I know we've riffed on before, yes. but just this idea that you want to act in accordance to nature and nature being more generally like what is in your control and what is best for everybody around you. And if you hurt another, you hurt yourself, all these kind of ideas, but it's the, it's the blending of what is in your power doing the best in your power according to these virtues that we hold at the highest regard and then letting the rest take care of itself exactly that is so well said and you know what that rely uh that relates to so directly is regenerative agriculture working within nature to grow food and you know staying within the rhythm of how things are how they used to be as opposed to trying to impose our will on the soil And, you know, that I really love that you brought in stoicism because I've never thought about that with all of this, but it does tie so well. Well, that feels like a pretty natural place to wrap up. Maybe a a final question on, I guess, on the future. What are you thinking? How are you planning to take this newfound passion with you into the next semester of college and beyond? Yeah, that's the question I'm asking myself too. And I'll say I just got my ears wide open to the intuition. I'm trying to see how things feel. But in terms of concrete, obviously, um, I'm really excited that I have two semesters left to take a bunch of classes on botany and ecology and all these things that I never really cared about before. Um, I finished up all my pre-med requirements. So now I can learn about plants, which just feels funny that I've never even thought about. So that's in terms of academic stuff. Um, I am planning on returning to the farm this summer to learn more. I'm going to several conferences this spring on ecological farming and regenerative agriculture. It's really exciting to have a new passion because it's like, as I told you, I'm reading a couple books right now on it. Like I just, I feel like I can be a student to this new world. And beyond that, long-term, well, long, long long-term, I have no idea, but short long-term as in post-grad, I now think that I want to do some sort of public service work to do with food access. So high quality food should not be limited to the wealthy elite. And there are a lot of misconceptions about how expensive it is to grow this food. And so I want to in some way work to lower the barriers to access through education and making this food available cost-wise. And I think that'll be a year after graduation. And then beyond that, who knows, maybe going into the supply chain. I don't know. That's awesome that you're able to take this passion and apply it to how you're going to spend your time. And I think at the end of the day, myself and a lot of other people our age are are looking for that. Y'all, it's scary, man. I don't know. That's why, I mean, just taking it one step at a time and trusting, trusting that it'll be, it'll be how it's meant to be if you, you know, stay grateful and open and all those things. So this does feel like a good way to wrap it up because I feel like it all came full circle. And I love talking about this with you. It's helping me like process it in my own mind. So thank you. Well, right back at you. This has been an absolute pleasure. And yeah, just a big time thank you for being so thoughtful and thoughtful about everything. I would say the same about you. It's so funny. You're right. It's so funny to see the arc of all of this. Cause yeah, freshman year, what you had just come off your back injury and all this, it was baseball and you're figuring out. So anyway, it has been, it's been a funny journey. Well, 
like I said, this seems like a great place to wrap up and just a big thank you. No, thank you.